um, who are with us. The, um, we're having a little te technical difficulty this morning, but I think we're ready to roll. So um, I'll go ahead and call the roll. Um, Mr. Wildervoir? Present. Um, Ms. Craybill? I'm here. Mr. Boyer? Okay. Not here. Okay, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Um, I second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? No. Okay. Um, approval of the minutes. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Go ahead, you do. Okay. I make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. I'll second. Okay. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we got that. Um, before we roll into our policies, um, I'd like to introduce Matilda Scott, AP from Williston, who will be joining us as the NC Papa representative. So thank you for being here, Ms. Scott. All right, so let's just roll right in. Sorry. Okay, the first up is policy code 3210, um, parental inspection of an objection to instructional materials. Um, is that Ms. Brinson? Oh, she's on Zoom too, isn't she? Okay, so we'll hold that one until later. Yeah. Or is there anybody else that wants to um, talk about that? I All right, let's put 3210 then to the side. We'll come back to that. Okay, so the next would be um, policy code 3460, graduation requirements. Um, Ms. Varnum? Yes, um, with regard to policy 3460, um, we realized that an, um, a piece of information that we had in prior policy that really is essential to us grading and placing students at the high school level um, really needed to be included again. And so we added a section, um, a new section C, and you can see it in blue um, print if you keep scrolling, on promotion requirements. Right there. Um, and this really is um, necessary for, like I said, grading and placing in high school um, in accordance to um, the particular grade level, not just by credits. And in this, um, students would, have, would re be required to have the following credits for grade to grade promotion. So for ninth to 10th, it would be six credits. From 10th to 11th, it's 12 credits. 11th to 12th is 20 <coughs> credits. And then um, of those, um, six credits required for promotion to 10th grade, two must be English, math, science, and social studies. And then there's um, detail on how we would process um, transfer students. So which is the, the total number of um, credits they were allowed and then um, reducing that opportunity. So um, in the past we had this in a little bit of a chart form and I think we can do that again. It just didn't move over like this, but the recommendation from, um, from curriculum and instruction as well as um, student support would be to include these promotion requirements. Okay, I, I had a question about that. I, this is just um, wordsmithing a little bit, but the last sentence where it says, please see your guidance counselor for total number of credits. Um, I was wondering if we wanted to put that more in the third person saying something like school counselors will advise or confirm rather than you as, you know, does that make sense? That does make sense. This was pulled from our curriculum guide, okay. um, which is written from the perspective of students, but that completely makes sense. Okay. All right, so I had that. Thank you for that. Um, that that's completely fine with me. The, the, the another question came up, it's on page 26, um, number four, um, about early graduation. Um, and it's talking about students wishing to graduate from high school in less than four years may request permission to do so on an accelerated schedule. Do we have um, any um, guidelines or stipulations on when we can have an accelerated schedule, like just because you feel like it or because you're trying to get out early and not have reduced credit, you know, that kind of thing? So. Um State board policy requires that we make an offer to students bef between eighth grade and ninth grade, or so incoming freshmen, that we make the offer to them and their parents that they can graduate on an accelerated schedule. So that's a state board requirement. 
Um, it's just that um, an accelerated schedule, as we've discussed before, requires all of the graduation requirements of the state and the district. So it's still a 28 credit um, plan. It's just an accelerated plan, and it has to be um, it has to be driven with some zero period and some fifth period courses potentially, or um, summer courses and a lot of dual enrollment. So we don't need to say anything about that. That this is just so folks are clear that we don't have an accelerated schedule to get us out with anything less than 28? So the curriculum guide that was revised and um, um, approved at the last Tuesday night's meeting uh, includes all of that because we did that in the revision. I, yes, uh, that's what made me think about it because yep. I read it in there, but we don't need to have that in policy so that I, folks are clear. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to over policy ourselves, but... Um, so I'm open to, to options. I think, I think this is the guidance and what's in the curriculum guide is the practice mm -hmm. so we don't want to mix the this with the practice no i, I understand that yeah, yeah, I so just this i think this i mean from from my stance if someone is going to graduate early we know that you have to start it in eighth grade um, you have to come in with x amount of credits in order to get to 28. there's no way that you can come in and <coughs> with the regular attempted credits and graduate early okay right yeah so there's i don't this is a specialty, and at the bottom it says the principal shall submit a student's written intent, intention to graduate early to the assistant superintendent of instruction. So they have to submit okay. documentation, so there's no... So we feel you know, like that we, that our practices in place will cover us on this and there won't be any future misunderstandings about what that means. Right, and there's been clear professional development for okay. all who are doing um, okay. academic advising on that. Okay. Um, then my last thing was, um, is there a reason that we don't put um, the numbers like in, in your charts where you have the you have the state requirements and you have the number kind of it's all the way to the left, you know, kind of buried in the text. But is there a reason why we don't put um, the number out in the local requirements as well, so that we like we did on page twenty, you put the six out there. And then on page 21, you have the total of 28. But is there a reason why we don't do four, four like that, so that shows that we mirror the state? Um, I want to look and see which ones you're which one you're talking about. Well, I'll here. just look at the, any of the charts. So right the, there, like any of the charts, there's no number okay. in the far right column. So this one, um, this one is occupational course of study, and you do not have additional local requirements for occupational course of study because they have work hours. So this is for students on, um, that have disabilities that are specifically eligible for and on the plan for occupational course of study. But if you scroll up to um, plans one and two, so this is number four. So if we go um, up, and this one is still occupational, yep. So the, the, the right-hand column, long story short, is only if we have extra. Right, Like with the, with the electives. Right. Okay. That is the only the place local requirements um, exist. They do not exist in the, in the specific coursework. Local requirements only exist in the electives okay. column, which is why it's only okay. there. Should it be, though, should we not say then extra local requirements instead of just, because it does, you know, if I was looking at this and didn't know what was going on, uh, it might, it might, I might lead it to say, well, there, you know, there's nothing locally required, but there are, you know, it's, we're just following the state requirements. So maybe instead of saying local requirements, extra local requirements might, you know, or additional local requirements, something along those lines. So it is clear to someone that there are additional. So, so I, I mean, I think that's fine if you want to add the word additional, but if you go to the top of the chart, that column says, um, it says local requirements. Yes, local requirements. Who's in charge of scrolling that? Yeah, so all the way up because it, if we just go all the way up to the beginning, we'll see it here. It just says local. That's, says me. local. I, that's my, what so Pete the, is saying is what I was saying. So yeah. the local, so remember, we have state requirements. That's right. 22. Right. But because of our district and board says, okay, we want to adopt six more, mm -hmm. that's where the local comes in. Technically, you know, by state requirements, that's all you need. Right. 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 Um, so that, but I mean, that, that to me, that makes it a little bit clearer to folks. If I'm just looking at this, don't know what's going on. Local requirements. So basically, there are no additional local requirements. So that's why I think if putting that word in there or, or a word in there might be. Where would you want? Right, right here. Uh, additional local requirements. 
like at the top of the chart. Right. Oh, so yeah. you're saying yeah. there's local requirements. Right. So you're additional, additional, additional. Yeah, so, so that additional. they know it's a plus local right. requirements. Exactly. Um, I don't have a I don't have a concern if that word additional went into the top of that column, but it would only be for um, sections one and two, right. um, because it would not apply to um, to three and four. Right. But is there any verbiage in there that leads in in the sentence that talks about local right there? Not specifically, it does in the curriculum course guide in multiple places, but not specifically because we, um, this, it, and, and please understand, this is a 3000 series, which really is um, curriculum instruction. I'm just stepping into this land um, because of graduation requirements specifically. Um, but this is the school board association, um, driven word, um, verbiage. So I think if we added a sentence in there, it wouldn't be a problem at all. I don't know that it exists already. That's where I would think if we added a sentence at the top to say the local requirements. Sure. So that that chart would still just put over say additional local requirements, but if we put it in a sentence, mm -hmm. that kind of led into to why we do local requirements. Right. Yeah, in section A, I think we could add a sentence that says, um, Students graduating from New Hanover County Schools will, because our, our previous, uh, the very top sentence in the in the very beginning of the policy um, says that the board recognizes the importance of setting rigorous graduate graduation requirements to help ensure students are receiving an education. Of course, to prepare them to be career and college ready and productive members of society. You could have a sentence right there that says, you know, therefore, beyond state requirements, New Hanover County Schools graduates will have six additional elective credits. Right. That would probably be the simplest way to do it. Can we, yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, I am in um, concert with Mr. Wilderbor on just making sure that mm -hmm. folks know that. Okay. Um, any other comments, um, Mr. Wilderbor, or anyone who's with us on graduation requirements? Okay. Well, then we'll move that one forward as presented. Um, change though. Huh? Oh, oh, change. as as with with the, with the the two changes the. Adding the additional and then um, and then changing up that last sentence in the blue, but that's not worth that. We don't need a we, need, we just need that to be changed and we'll bring that forward. Okay. Um, next up is policy 50, 50, 40. Ms. Craven. What? If I. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Mr. Yeah. Wilbur. <laughs> if I could uh, suggest, maybe we could go back to thirty two ten. Ms. Brinson has. Uh, well, I was just going to go in order, and then okay, we can that's get fine, that's fine. the, um, and we'll do that. Okay. Um, 5440, um, news media relations. Um, Mr. Smith, we you want to take that uh, one for yes, us? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, all. Thank you. So policy 5040, news media relations, was adopted by the board last summer, and that was around the time I joined the district. Today, I'm proposing the committee and subsequently the board uh, consider a slight change to remove the restrictive language which requires NHCS employees to, quote, receive approval from the chief communications officer or the superintendent prior to sharing information with the media and change it to something like uh, the communication outreach division will, upon request, coordinate news coverage with media, arrange staff interviews, and respond to requests for information in compliance with policy 5070, 7350, public records, retention, release, and disposition. NHCS is always open and accessible to the media. News organizations may contact any staff member to ask questions about a story, positive or negative. NHCS employees are welcome, but not required, to speak with the press and are encouraged to contact the Communication and Outreach Division with any questions or concerns. Now, Full disclosure, I lifted most of this language from another North Carolina Big 12 school district. So this change is in line with best media relations practices across larger districts. Uh, and equally important, it makes it clear to our employees that there is zero retaliation for unsanctioned interviews. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over for discussion. Okay, Mr. Wardenborg, questions? Well, no, it's not a question, but I think, I think it's very appropriate because I've heard, and, I, and like I say, very, uh, from, from different sources that, that Supposedly there is some kind of retaliation. You know, we, you know, the folks have been told not to speak. Oh yeah, not they'll to put a petition out on you if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like there's I say, to me, it's not. And you know, there's no. You know, I've not heard or seen any proof of it. But you know, there's a rumor out there in the cloud or something. I have so. Yeah. Oh, did? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> there's a thousand signatures to it. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
itself. But I think so. This this makes sense to me. Yes, sir. And I think nine times out of ten, <laughs> it'll it'll still be folks coordinating with the office, getting the information they need for interviews, logistically setting them up. Um, but I think very little will change other than best practices and the message it sends. Okay, um, just a couple points of clarification, um, not necessarily that we need to do anything more. Um, it, are employees who give comments, are they allowed to do it during school time, during school hours? So we During employment hours? Yeah. Right, right. Um, we're always looking at internal controls. Okay. And so, um, and the board's been on my correspondent emails with the press asking them to coordinate with us and some of that, most of that is around internal controls. If a teacher is teaching, we can't have them doing interviews, and so we facilitate that logistically. Um, and so I think, again, the language is encouraged to coordinate with us, and in, in so doing, we would ensure that it doesn't disrupt class time, that it doesn't disrupt you know, operations during the day. Um, but I think that we should probably stop shy of saying they can't do it during school hours because we otherwise probably would have done it during school hours, just coordinated an appropriate time okay. for that interview. But they also can't just show up on campus. There's right. some rules that are right. in there. Right, right, and, and that is in yeah. here, you know, as well. Yeah. Yes, I was just, you know, curious because, you know, someone recently brought up an, an email that an employee sent us on their, on their own, to, on their school, on their, on their work time. And so I just wanted to make sure that we were they all could have clear. Been on their lunch break. Well, well exactly. Their so um, yeah. So that's. Well, they're planning. Okay. It, so, it, it also. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go. Uh, I shouldn't have acted like I wasn't going to keep talking. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also need to understand too that if it's a classified employee. It really should take place during their work hours because we would have to pay them if it was outside work. There's some Fair Labor okay. Standards Act about classified versus certified folks too. Okay. All right. So I don't want to over policy it, you know, but I just wanted that yes, that um, to be brought up. Um, and then so and so what if I'm hearing you correctly that we don't need to have the same sort of policy with employees that we have with the school board um, policy 2220 where we're supposed to if we give a statement we're supposed to let the superintendent and the communications department know so we don't need to go that that level that, that would be my recommendation that we not add the language for that requirement furthermore I would I would recommend that either today or, or if we're not prepared to do so in, in the future look at policy 2220 okay. and amend that requirement I think that would have been appropriate you know several years ago when we didn't have the, the tools and capability to kind of um, scrape the media environment and, and okay. see what was out there. But, but now, I don't, I don't mean to sound like a Marvel character, I see everything. <laughs> we know everything that, that, uh, that's happening with Google and others. And so I don't, I don't think that, uh, that that requirement in that policy is even required moving forward either. Okay. But that's at the will of the board. We can come back to that. Okay, yeah, Mr. Dr. Barnes. I don't know if this is a Colin response or not. If someone does respond during work hours, does that mean they represent the school system when they're speaking, or are they speaking as an individual? That was my that next question. So, yeah, Colin, you want to jump in on that? Could you hear? Oh, sorry, I could not hear the question. I can hear you, Ms. Crayville, but I'm having trouble hearing other folks. Okay, hold on. He'll come down. My question, Colin, is if we allow people to speak while they are working, does that indicate they are speaking for the school system or they're speaking as an individual? So, it doesn't necessarily have to indicate that they're speaking for the school system, but it, it possibly, you know, could based on the circumstances. So we might want to have them clarify that they're, you know, they're speaking as an individual. Um, and I guess, you know, it depends on the facts and circumstances and what it is we're talking about. If we allow, if, if we release somebody or allow somebody to take time out of their work day, to speak with the, the press about something. Um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I think we would, we would maybe want to talk about it on a case by case basis. Um, I mean, I think we, we can say that, you know, folks during the work day need to just be attending to their work duties and they don't have the right to do this during the work day, but we also could allow folks some, some flexibility to do that as long as they made it clear that they were speaking on their as individuals and not representatives of the school system yes yeah, so Colin um, what you probably couldn't hear her here was when we were talking about um, what were we talking about that addressed that kind of same thing um, that they don't need to um, tell us that they're doing it and um, oh and during school time um, dr. Barnes had said that he would prefer um, at least you know right this minute um, to have classified employees speak on school time 
because they, um, we would have to pay them overtime if they came back to speak, but then would that not imply that? Well, it, it, I think the first yeah, I guess I'm not clear what we're talking about, really. Like, I mean, if a, if a classified employee is out there talking to the press in their individual capacity, we're not going to pay them for that because they're just, that's not, that's not work. They're just expressing their First Amendment rights. Okay. So the second question really answers the first. Okay. All right. So I, I think we're clear. So um, could you work with Josh and like make sure we got the wording right on, on yep. that? I will. And I apologize. I have to step off now. I have an appointment at 930, but yeah. I, will, I will get with Mr. Smith. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Thank you for attending. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay. So um, with those, you'll get with him. And um, that one, I think, is ready to move forward with the edits. Everybody go with that? Mr. Warwood, did you have any more questions? No. Okay. All right. So we will do that one. So we've got Colin doing that, Julie's doing that. Okay. So then we um, come back to policy 3210. And that is Ms. Brinson. The um, parental inspection of and objection to instructional materials. Yes. So we have this policy in place. And so we also have procedures that go along with the policy. And the procedures, you know, have been on our website under um, curriculum and instructions page, um, under resources. It's a couple clicks to get to it, so it wasn't really easy. So I've asked um, the webmaster to change that and to have it under the main heading of um, students and families and those resource links there. But my question was, you know, initially, should we also somehow either link it in this policy or I wasn't sure if you had procedures on it so that way when people see the policy they can click and then they see the procedures and the forms. I don't want people assuming that we are trying to make it difficult for them to complete this process. Ms. Princeton, if you wouldn't mind, can you just walk us, uh, I've read it, but can you walk us through exactly, you know, I go to X, Y, or Z school, I'm upset about this book because I think it's Yep, so you, your parent, you have a kid at X school, there's a book that your child brought <laughs> home that you have concerns with, so the first thing would be to have a conversation with the principal. If it can't be solved quickly, then it, there's this form you fill out, and basically that starts the challenge process. And then that goes to the, at the school level, the media specialist pulls together a committee that includes parents, teachers, um, the media specialist, and the, the media specialist kind of guides the process. They don't really have a say in it because they're guiding the process, but you have representation of the school there. They then go through the process, read the book, look at the, um, read the evaluations of the book and what's out there, trying to look at the curriculum, see where it fits in the curriculum. They then do a write-up, come to a conclusion, do a write-up, and then that's given back to the parent, you know, with their results. As the parent, if you're not happy with what the results are, then you can take it to the district level. And then that's where um, Dr. Faison's office then would do the same process at the district level involving central office people at that level. It does go to the same process, then again communicates back to the parent what their results are. You can either like it, Go with it. If you're not happy still, then they can appeal it to the board. And then that's when it would come to your level of board members. Okay. And is there any kind of t time frame on this? Because I know mm. I've heard one group has got <laughs> like a... There, like, there isn't because a lot of it depends on if it's, a, if it's an actual book in the media center because it's all instructional material. So it could be an online resource. It could be anything. But if it's a book, the issue is you've got to find enough copies of the book to give them to everybody at the school level to be able to read it and then give them time to read it on top of everything else that they do. So um, there really isn't time. I know I've seen other districts where it says the school level one could take up to 30 days because you've got to give people the time to read it, pull the resources together, you know, check for the, um, get all the documentation together before they communicate. So it's not a simple, quick process. It does take time. You know, a lot of it depends on also how big the book is, you know. And one final question, just because um, this has been brought to me also, we had a situation where a book fair had a book that was similar. And obviously, mm -hmm. one thing is you could say, but then if you don't like the book, don't buy the book. But right. it was a you know, questionable book that was brought in a, in a book fair mm -hmm. situation. So um, the media specialists are the one who bring the vendors in for the book fair. Um, I think 
and I, I'd have to check because I haven't you know, had conversations with them. But I imagine if it's um, elementary school doing a book fair, they try to find books that would you know, go above and below because you've got kids at all different levels. So they try to make sure they have books that would probably you know, be you know, kindergarten, even maybe a little bit lower, to middle school books because the kids at fifth grade or fourth grade can read much higher. So they have, try to have a wide variety of books that cover a wide variety of topics. Um, but, you, but you're right, the issue is you know, if there's books there that parents have concerns with, then you're right, then you wouldn't want your kid to buy the book, you know, but you can't stop somebody else from being able to purchase a book that, you know, may be appropriate for their child. And the other part of that is that a parent has to, who has a student at that particular school, has to make the request. Yeah. Um, and then, because um, that book may not be at school B, they may say that's okay. So it's not actually pulled from that, that school. Yeah. So, so we um, hmm. have to make sure that we're looking at you know, the school, um, even if it goes all the way to the board, does that, uh, the next school have to do the exact same thing? Right? Yeah, so you're only removing it. You know, the process only applies to the one school where the parent has a child that's attending. So it's site specific. Yes, it's site specific. Thank you for bringing that down to two words for us. So let's just say that we have, like, we've been hearing from Call of the Audience about um, a lady that says that she's checked out all these books. You know, how does a lady from the community go and check out books? She, she didn't check out, like, physically check the book out and take it. She, we do have online the Destiny Library. So basically, you can go to our website, and there's a link to all of our schools catalog, basically. So um, you can do searches and see where the book is. So that's what they've done. They didn't physically check the book out. Okay. They know that the book is in that library because of seeing that information. Okay. All right, so a couple questions I had in there. Well, first of all, do, to, to Mr. Mortimer's point, do we need to have any wording in here about um, the time frame will vary or do we not need to do that? Like I know in a lot of our um, um, special ed kind of things, it says you have you know, five days to do this and three days to do that. Um, so is this worth even making a note that time frames will vary to give, I mean, to even say what you just said? Yeah, so um, Dr. Faust actually shared some resources with me, so we will be going back and looking at the procedures and doing some edits and changes to kind of give more information as far as like the time frame and then, you know, more information about, you know, um, just the guidelines and the process to kind of make it more clear to kind of answer these kinds of questions. Okay, so is, uh, all right, so. But it's in, not gonna change the policy, it'll just change the procedures. It will change procedures, we don't, okay, after the policy. Okay, so the, um, do we need any of what you just described about that procedure um, to be like a 3210-P or dash R like we do with, um, suspensions or you know how we have the the dash R after some of our policies do do you think this one warrants that level well I, I know in conversation detail in conversation that we've had we talked about just linking it maybe right in the policy so linking the procedure and the policy instead of having the the dash R after it because I think Typically, we just do regulations. We don't do procedures. Okay. And if we're going to start doing one procedure, then we probably need to have all procedures that way, and that's a, that's a lot. So we are looking at just linking the procedures within the policy. So help this this newbie. Um, what is the difference between a regulation and a procedure um, when it come when we come right down to it? Like, I'm gonna let Julie speak to that to the regulation piece. <laughs> So um, generally, regulation, those that are listed as a policy regulation, like for example, if we were looking at graduation requirements and if, um, if state board requirement or um, general statute required regulations to be created as a part of policy or related to policy, then we would do it that way. That's my understanding. Okay. Um, because policy is really the, the what and we develop the how separately from that so that we have a little more flexibility to make those edits based on nuanced situations. Um, so I think if, if um, general statute or state board policy don't require it, and, and of course I'll let Dr. Faust weigh in if he sees that differently, um, then I would say linking a procedure makes a lot more sense. Okay, and I think that that's what Colin had told I me. Mean, he's yeah. not here to verify that, but I know I've talked to him about it. I'm sure you have, um, that he, he was fine with that um, so do we in the link it, it does the link take us to 
the page that says um, reconsideration procedure <coughs> for instructional materials. Yes. Okay, and then as that part of that link is where you find the request form. Correct, because it's it's all there, all four pages, so they can see the whole process. Okay. That that has to happen, and then they see the form. So the form is there for the school level as well as for taking it up to the central office level. So okay. we're giving them the forms. All up front. Okay, so let's just say that a parent doesn't know about this policy and they go to their principal to talk. Mm -hmm. um, would the principal be able to pull up the procedure and, yes. or the form and give them a copy of the form? Yes, I have been sharing that with the principal okay. because of you know what's been, been questions that have been coming up for the call the audience. So I have been sharing with principals, you know, the procedures that they're supposed to be following this policy, okay. these procedures. And so once we link it, then I will email them again saying. This is where it's linked. The media specialists are also familiar with that process because typically when, when somebody evaluates and there's an issue, it's typically with a library book. But okay. you need to understand this process, though, is for all instructional materials. Right, like if you're watching a video or if you're watching... Or, or you, it's a website, or you know, a website. resource okay. that you don't like or something. Okay. So we should be um, kind of talking about that sending your concern to the school board really is not the, your first step. Correct. The first, I mean, it's just like every other yes. thing, you, you address it at, the, at the, um, the level closest to the situation. Yeah, and when we meet later this week and I go through that demonstration, I will be addressing that then. Okay. All right, so the only other question, that, that's very good. Thank you so much. The, um, the only other question I have was in the first line where it says, um, in the policy 3200, selection of instructional materials, the board establishes a process for the selection of materials. Um, so when does the board do that? I don't know that I the, that where, should I be? There is a policy for selection of instructional materials. It is policy 3200. Right. That actually goes through but you guys approved the process okay, that they're so supposed to be going through, schools are supposed to be going through. And I shared this with schools okay. also and told them that they need to make sure they're following this process. So the board establishing means we've already seen the policy and we approved it. Correct. Okay. Um, is the curriculum committee involved in any of that? Well, we are having our first curriculum committee meeting um, May 24th, I mean 25th, but I will tell you, trying to get some history around it, the way I understand it, the meetings have been um, more about um, the instructional team um, sharing an overview of the curriculum. Right. So I think if at that time, if the board has some questions, they were being answered because the curriculum committee, like this time, the enrichment classes and the special classes will be sharing an overview of their curriculum. Okay. So I don't know how in depth and how many board members have been there. But that definitely would, and, yeah. And Miss Justice is our liaison. Yes, right. But we don't really get a report back from that. The only way you find out about it is if you, um, okay, is if you've read or or watched or were in attendance. Okay. So that may just be board member homework that we have to just go and make ourselves more familiar. Well, I can definitely talk to Miss Justice and make sure that we give a, a, an. Um, an overview of anything came out that I think the board, or we, we think that the board yeah. should be aware of. But I think that would be the time if yeah. I'm thinking. And there is a, there is a section on our on our um, every agenda for um, committee well, reports. Right. Okay. We just, okay. We haven't really been getting highlights of that. But. Yeah, and I can tell you that um, with it, on the same lines as that is we really have invited more teachers. We've, we've really encouraged principals, so our curriculum meeting next time, you should see more teachers and administrators because we're not hot. We want everybody to see the curriculum and ask the questions because when we're on the same page, it's just easier for everyone to communicate what we're doing. And we're also working on something with our website, but that's another Okay. Thing. That sounds wonderful. Just All right, so one for one more thing. Yeah, sorry. And since we're talking about this policy, this, this one section comes to mind and I, and I just maybe need some more clarification on it. Uh, you know, in the one, two, three, four, fifth Which, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilbur, what, what policy are you talking about right uh, now? We're still at 30, uh, 32. 32, 10. 10. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it says that the school, board, uh, the school committee determines any material violates constitutional or other legal rights of the parent or student. Um, 
my concern there is, you know, say there's something that's just totally inappropriate for an elementary school, just totally inappropriate, something that's vulgar or whatever, and you, we can all think about what, where, you know, what we all heard about. That wouldn't necessarily be addressed here, I don't think, because it's not, it's not illegal, it's not uh, constitutionally, you know, but it's inappropriate for, for a, you know, a second grader to get their hands on. Well, in the, How's that addressed in, here? In the process, when they look at it, when they look at the, the piece that's challenged, it, they look at the whole content instead of taking just a sentence or a paragraph out of it. So they look at the whole thing. That's why the, we have to get the book for the people. So they look at the whole, the whole book, the whole resource, instead of just one piece of it, mm -hmm. to then look at the, the context and everything and then see how that relates to the curriculum. So that's how that would be evaluated. And then a determination would be made. Okay, but, but I'm saying, I guess the, the, the criteria here is, is, is it illegal or is it against the Constitution? But what if it's just inappropriate? I mean, that's not addressed here, I don't think. Well, I think what will happen is when you go through the process, so I can remember when I was um, a teacher, mm -hmm. there was a book, I think Beverly Cleary, who was a dear goddess, Margaret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Judy in Lou. there, there's a, um, a scene where the little boy is, I think it's the little boy who's nervous, and he turns and he tries to go, but he goes into the girl's bathroom. Um, and in there, so there were some parents who were like, that's inappropriate for a boy to get in the bathroom. So the school had to read the book and then give context around. It wasn't like he just said, oh, I'm going in the girl's bathroom. It was he tried to go, she tried, one of the characters just tried to get away from the situation and the door was just, it was like, so it, technically it wasn't, um, um, for some it was offensive. Mm -hmm. But once we put context to what it was that it was on, so it went all the way through the committee. They reread it and they gave feedback to the to the okay. parent. So if it was just, but say it was worse than that, I guess. Right, right. That would, you know, would it, guess it doesn't, I mean, we're, I guess my concern here is we have a, a, a bar we put up here that's either illegal or it's unconstitutional. But it might not be either of those, but it still could be but appropriate. For Mr. Wilbur, it says so you it's, if yeah. you feel, if a parent feels that it's inappropriate, mm -hmm. they can still complete it's in the, So Mr. Wilbur, it says, if an objection made by a parent or student is not based upon constitutional or legal rights, the school may accommodate the objection after considering the effect on the curriculum, any burden on the school, teacher, or other students that the accommodation would create, and any other relevant factors. So okay, they can so still, still do it for those other things. Okay, that, that's how I just want to make sure that we did mm -hmm. have that. That part in. Thank you. Well, and I also kind of just wanted to use the same analogy that um, let's just say a fourth grader you know was reading this book, and we know in that book you know um, Margaret you know gets her uh, menstrual cycle for the very first time, and some parents haven't talked to their kids about that. So there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the parent just I mean everybody's moral compass is and tolerance is a little bit different so I personally don't think that the school system needs to be on top of everybody's moral compass so that book was a that's where I thought you were going with that analogy yeah, so yeah, I, too, just, I thought you were I going there too that's what we I went ahead and went there <laughs> okay. yeah I was sorry but it but it's the same thing I mean that book would not have been pulled well some parents would say no you can't read that book I haven't talked to my kid about that yet um, so yeah and and just to be a little more typically, I should say typically, most teachers will read, hopefully, they'll read the book and then let parents know this is in my book. Yeah. And sometimes as you get older, obviously in English, so you would then let parents know in chapter this mm -hmm. is what's going to go on. Or we're not going to read that chapter in class, you're going to read that whole. And then all we're going to do is have a conversation around it. But again, if a parent has an issue with it, they can definitely come and talk. And sometimes coming and talking with the teacher helps explain where they're going with it. Versus, and, and then sometimes like, well, I'm not going to talk to the teacher. I don't like it. And this is what I want. They can do that too. So they can do the complaint. They can go through the committee. Or they can go talk to the teacher. And the teacher can explain, this is where I'm going with it with my, my lesson. But would they be given an alternative book? You can. Yes, okay. you can. I've yeah. done that too. And, yeah, and if it's a lesson, they'll do that. So there's a difference between a teacher using a book and with instruction versus a book just being a library that a kid can check out. So yeah, if they're using a book with instruction, yes, everything Dr. Faust just said, they'll do. You know, they'll have that issues and they'll ask, you know, say, we're look, reading this book. This is the, 
this may have some concerns, you know, it's your choice. And then ultimately, if you don't want to, then the, typically it's finding another resource that still covers the same objectives or content that they're trying to get. Usually if it's a book in the level. library, then it's different. It would be, okay, that's fine. Then you have to have a conversation with your kid, maybe, you know, that, that's not the book that they check out. Usually we front load it, it, um, with the curriculum piece. It's, and what I mean by that is, you, teachers and principals kind of know books that might have some issues. So they do like Dr. Faust and they educate parents about this is what's coming. Hopefully as well, our teachers are saying, this material is here for you to, you know, to review and allow that. And most of the time when you do that, one or two things happen. Parents realize that it's part of the context and it's fine. Or the teacher can go in and address that this kid will not be part of this. Because nobody wants to present information that is contrary to what a parent wants for their child. That's not our role, that's not who we are. So we, you know, with the front loading information, and I say that to say if we can make sure our policies, and I think they do, direct the policies back to the principals, the teachers, they, they really can handle a lot of that situation. And, and, and it's, it, it really stops there most of the time. And it really is incumbent upon the school board to send people back right. it to really the is. level closest to their work yeah. and not field all the, the, you know, and tell parents that when they send us emails. Because ultimately, we got to hear an appeal. So it's not our job to go into the school and say, yeah. hey, Principal A, you got bad books. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's a matter of being feel supported. That way the teacher feels supported. They feel respected as well, right, that you trust them to, to do this, but they know their layers, right? You just can't just do anything, so, yeah. yeah I think, again, with all of us here teaching, using a novel, um, oftentimes you want to ask, what is the standard that I'm trying to right. teach? What is the standard I want my kids to learn? Is this the only book that will provide, you know, excel uh, with the excellence with that standard? Is that the only book? And then there's conversations that our school leaders have to have with teachers and saying, you know, if it's controversial, why? Why do you want? What is it about this book? This is the only book that you can teach. Let's just take another look. And sometimes you have to have those conversations because sometimes, you know, if I'm a teacher, I mean, that may be my, mm -hmm. I've taught it for three years, it gets what I want, but it's, it's that the only book. And I had to have that conversation as a superintendent with a book um, in another school district um, where you use the N-word. And it was with a group of high school students. And the teacher thought, hey, in this class, we'll raise our hand and how many want to say the word? Okay, so the <laughs> kids raised their hand and there were kids who were offended. Then there was a group that's like, well, let's just do hmm on this one. So to make a long story short, the question was, why did you choose this book? If kids, if you're having to go around and vote mm -hmm. to see if you want to say a word, or what, then let's pull the whole book. Right? Yeah. There, there's no reason to make someone feel uncomfortable in a class just for you to teach a book. Because we can, if that's the purpose, I'm sure there are some other books out there that will teach the same principle mm -hmm. without using that book. So, I mean, there's really good conversation, dialogue that can take place um, when you're really trying to hit the curriculum. But it doesn't have to be a specific prescribed book. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So, Ms. Scott, do you? Um, I would like to add, um, many times in the PLCs at the beginning of the year, um, there are a list of novel sets that are belonging to the media center. Um, they get along with the media center um, and talk about those banned books every year. Um, and so those books are really pre-selected and in the PLCs they talk about the controversial books that may come up. So there's a lot of PLC around that um, in the ELA class. I have an experience with working with a lot of the teachers. So, they do a lot of pre-planning prior to just selecting those books, and they try to stay away from the controversy. Very good, thank you. All righty, so um, are we ready to move this forward? Are, are there any changes that we need to make to this to move it forward that I was trying to jot down? And I mean, I, the, most of them were just like my questions, but you had yes. said that you were, you were looking on the procedure, but if we're only looking at procedure, then the policy is probably ready to go forward. I mean, the, the policy is already there. You've already approved the policy. Yeah, okay. It's there. So yeah, we're just we're just working on changing the procedure. We'll link this for now, and then I will work with Dr. Faison 
you know, for the recommended changes we want to make. And then we will, when those changes come up, we will share them with the board what those changes are and we'll get those then posted. Okay, so we're ready to move um, 3210 you know, to the next level with the, the change of just hyperlinking the procedure and the forms as they currently are. Correct. Okay. All right, got that one down. All right. And so then the last one um, we have is policy 4400 attendance. Um, Ms. Barnum? Yes. I don't have a. Um, we, we've not had time to pull a group of staff together, um, a group of teachers and um, administrators together. Have had some conversation with administrators though, um, and and we know from an administrative level and at the teacher level, um, we see a need to go back to um, some additional high school requirements consistent with prior policy language. So prior policy language, um, but, but we need to discuss, but, so I don't have wording for you, but I think we need to discuss kind of the ramifications and the unintended consequences, for example. So in my research, I found that prior policy, and again, this is prior to the um, North Carolina School Board Association working with us on policy revisions, Prior policy was um, 8212, and the additional high school requirements um, were added in under 11th absence. So after, uh, for additional high school requirements, um, you know, of course, talking about while well, school attendance is important at all levels, and then it goes on to say at the 11th absence, a student who misses more than 10 days in a semester shall receive an incomplete mm -hmm. for the course and may not be awarded course credit except by determination of the attendance committee upon careful review of the student's records. So what that yielded um, was um, students who were um, passing the class but not being awarded um, credit and being marked in um, power school and then on their transcript with an AF um, for attendance failure. So they passed the class um, with regard to their grades, but they did not um, receive a credit. And, and so in my research, I found that um, in November of 2018, um, senior staff had this on their discussion, uh, on their agenda for discussion um, in an effort wanting to modify um, this policy in order to better affect the dropout rate, of course. So you've got students who um, by their grade demonstrate at least um, proficiency, if not mastery, but then don't earn the credit. And so those are students that um, may um, contribute to dropout and certainly we're not contributing to the graduation rate by remaining in their cohort for their credits. So um, it was a way to enable credits for those who pass regardless of attendance. So that's the other side of this. Um, however, it is still the recommendation. So there, there are going to be some unintended consequences and some layers of this work which I think really requires um, a group of uh, administrators, teachers, and again students like we have done with regard to um, other work with grading practices for example, I think a team needs to come together to really determine the language around and the expectations around this um, just so that we don't create unintended consequences that are that are worse. If I could jump in. Um, I agree with you. I think, I think that's an excellent idea. I think it does need to be looked at very closely. Uh, I'm going to use the example that I've used several times, and I hate to, you know, he's going to say that thing again, isn't he? But I, I've spoken uh, for an hour and 45 minutes with one of our uh, seasoned uh, teachers at one of the local high schools, and he was giving me the example of a person that was with him for the first uh, quarter, and he got an 83, and he turned around and said, I won't see you again because there's no attendance policy and the, you know, the 50 average with the 83, I pass, so I won't see you again. And I go back to the simple fact that our job is to educate students. And if our job is to educate students, they need to be with their teachers. And uh, you know, I, I remember as a principal spending many, 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 two, uh, many days in, in courtrooms because we had to get people to get their kids to school. Um, but I think that is, uh, that we do need to have some kind of attendance policy at the high school level mm -hmm. to, you know, because students need to be with their teachers. So I think it should actually be 
pre-K through 12. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, yeah. right. 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 I find it very difficult to be in a school district and I will look up athletes because I go to the different games and see an athlete who has 37 absences. Mm -hmm. And so then my question is, so how much seat time did you mm -hmm. miss? Mm -hmm. Because so how is it? How is it that a student gets an 83 and then misses, I'm using that, your 83, and the 37 days out? Mm -hmm. Like I don't understand how that works because um, if you're not in the classroom, how are you being prepared? And then I think about what the state talks about, chronic absenteeism. So there is a definition by the state that's called chronic absenteeism. So we have actually gone over, and I think it's more than 10, maybe more than 15 days or so, where there's a, there's a definition for it. So how are we violating that and not calling it what it is? And so we have social workers. And so there's a chronic absenteeism. So how is it that we are abiding by the rules of chronic absenteeism and then how do we get around if there are only 90 or 78 days in a semester if a child misses 27 of those days? How is it that we then justify, because I'll even go to that, if a student, because I looked up a student, um, had 60, and I was like, well, how did the student get a 60 if he missed 37 days? Right. So then it's not, the, and I'll be honest, it's not the 50. Then I was like, well, why didn't someone talk to the teacher? Because if you had, and I know it sounds like I'm blaming the teacher, but I'm like, if you had a kid in your class, how did that kid get a 60 and he missed 37 days? And then they were out on our fields playing. All right, so you're doing a representation, you're representing our district, and you violated, and we co-signed it. And so my question then goes back to, why don't we have something in place for chronic absenteeism? Why aren't we holding individuals responsible if they're not coming to school? And I know that there are rules in place by law that states that students have to be in school. And how did we get around not having a policy for um, attendance? And I get it. You know, I'm a, I'm a student. I'm a super a student superintendent. So I'm going to fight for students always. Doesn't matter. I'm going to fight. But if they're wrong, they're wrong. Kids have to come to school. So to, to offer a little bit of clarity, um, with regard to compulsory attendance, we're compliant with compulsory attendance. The issue is that um, many of our high school students, once they get beyond 16 years old, they don't fall under compulsory attendance, and then they're not attending. But what about chronic absenteeism? Yes, so um, under 16, so under in the compulsory attendance age range, which would be at the time they enroll until they're 16. So that is what many of our um, school social workers are doing, our juvenile attendance council, um, sitting with Judge Corpening, bringing those families in and looking at interventions. Um, there's a lot of work around that. Um, this is this is in addition to that where where we reach those high school kids who and they can also manipulate students can manipulate their attendance because we've got period attendance being taken at high school and so you may have perfect attendance in one car in one course and miss you know 60 days in another the other thing that complicates this as dr faust mentioned is athletic eligibility is based on prior semester and so you can have a student who is still eligible and on the court as an athlete um, who in the current semester really would not or for the pre um, future semesters wouldn't reach um, athletic eligibility due to attendance and, and, and possibly grades. So this is really specific to those high school students. But I, maybe I'm wrong, but a lot of school districts have a definition for chronic absenteeism. And I think it's more than 10 days. Um, or the state, someone justifies what that actual chronic would be. Um, because when it gets there, whether they are 16 or 17, we're responsible for educating them. Right. And I know that I would have a hard time as a teacher if the kid wasn't in my class. Right. And, Which, and compulsory attendance does define, the general statute identifies that, and, it's the, it, and it also clarifies when we do the three-day letter, the six-day letter, the 10-day letter, and it requires at the 10-day letter, and. Mr. Wildebor and I worked on this for years back in another district together. Uh, we had one situation where we worked on so much. But um, at the 10th, 
you have to determine before you you um, issue that um, you know to the magistrate that request for appearance, you have to determine if a good faith effort was made. And general statute requires that good faith effort determination. So that is where that definition lies. And so up until through the compulsory attendance age, our practices are in place. It's, it's that high school level where they aren't in place because if policy doesn't make a requirement for attendance and then all we have are grades, then students don't actually have to attend. So that's why we think that we're, we're recommending as an administration um, to bring this back and after um, having pretty consistent discussion among um, traditional high school principals. It's just the wording of it and, and um, the way to go about this really needs to be developed with um, administrators, teachers, and students so um, the in the room. So the state of North Carolina says who is chronically absent from a school in North Carolina and it gives you percent students who miss 15 days or more and this was, um, and they consider them chronic absent. Well, Ms. Crable, I would like to make a motion to uh, <clears throat> take policy 4400 and hold it in committee until the committee can be formed to uh, review this policy. The, all right, so before I second that, the, I want to make sure we're, we're all on the same page with this. So this, we're, a couple questions. So as we're considering for this um, committee that's coming up. Um, we used to make phone calls, you know, um, every time a child was absent, and I don't think that's happening anymore. It, 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 it is. is. It's it's a, a, it's a okay, they're called, safety, they're called the morning safety call. Now, during, um, during times of COVID where we didn't have 100% of our students in school, it became really problematic to figure out who was on which schedule and to do the safety call, so they were stopped, but at the, um, at a time soon after we returned at 100% um, for all students face-to-face, -face, um, the AM safety call was sent back out. So how can a, how can a parent say, I don't even know my, that, that my kid's not in school? It's because they're not listening, they're not picking up their calls? Or their their it, phone number might not be the right phone number in PowerSchool, too. They right, okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Parents be, we would want parents to um, ensure that we have their um, current um, contact information and those um, are automatically generated every day. And some, some of us still have the old landline so it might go to landline and the parent may actually be at, at work at that point. The child may be at home. So right. And you can offer them. text messages too because I get text messages mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. parents love those. So we did, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, a communication thing you know, that mm -hmm. we, we talk to parents about. <coughs> the school board actually established the definition for chronic absenteeism um, on February 21st of 2018. And it says the board's definition is consistent with the guidance shared by the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation and national organization of attendance work to define chronic absence as missing more than 10% of enrolled school days in a given year. So the 10% of the enrolled school day. So yes. yeah, so just because you show up in the beginning in the morning, right. if you're not there at the end of the day, or if you come in late every day. And it, right, exactly. It counts as for um, regarding tardies as well. Right. For example, right. right, for example, that's actually um, data that's used in determination of a student with a disability. If that student is not present in school and has, has reached that definition of chronic absenteeism, that brings into question whether it's a disability or an attendance issue. Okay. Yeah. So we have all those things to worry about. Um, the under B with late arrivals and early departures where it says each high school <coughs> must establish protocols to address late arrivals and early departures, would that not be one that we want to be consistent district-wide on and not let each school develop their own or am I just reading too much into that? Yeah, I mean that's that's my thoughts and so I just wanted to, I, I don't like when, I mean I know we, we talk a lot about site-based management um, but some of these things principals do not need to have that much latitude, I don't think. I mean, I think principals would love it if they could say it's a district-wide policy yeah. because it is one of the things that parents really get upset when you tell them that, you know, we can't dismiss at this time or, you know, because they come 10 minutes before, we got to oh, find your kids, kids, but your kids can, yeah. yeah. So I think principals would appreciate having some meat behind it. Okay. Um, May I add, um, I haven't taught high school um, for three years. My students knew the policy better than I did. Mm -hmm. And they could tell you, yep. well, yep. as long as I show up and I pass the class. Mm -hmm. um, so 
and I was new to high school, and mm -hmm. so I was not experiencing that in the lower levels. Um, but when I got to Ashley High School, the chronic absences existed there, and that was one of the things that's like, okay, that was my introduction. Know this, a lot of our students will come to pass the course, but will not be in school when I was like, well, how does this happen? Mm -hmm. um, so students, and they share that information among lower levels. So then you get the ninth grader, 10th graders mm -hmm. who adopt this attitude and this characteristic because your juniors and seniors have gone through those three years of absenteeism with no recourse. So I think it's very important that it's very specific um, in the language that students as well don't read between the lines and try to manipulate the policies. I think, I think it sounds like we already have an NC Papa and school administration rep and Ms. Scott to join that, um, <laughs> that committee, which I, I feel like is landing in, in my lane. <laughs> well, I'd love to serve on that too, if, if that's okay with you. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll see that's how fine. that works and make that's sure fine. all board members get a chance to participate. Right, absolutely. Um, on page 30, where, um, where we're talking about, in addition, students participating in disciplinary techniques categorized as in-school suspension may not, will not be counted as absence. Um, can that be, like, can those words be different? Or like, um, restorative practices, and you know, including such as, I mean, is, I don't know, I'm just trying to think so, of. Yeah, so that's a, that is um, specifically referencing the, um, the codes in power school, for example, okay. in school suspension is a specific code. If you want to call it something different at the school level, that's fine, but it's still an, an ISS. And the same thing with OSS, but both neither of those can, um, or an ISS is not counted as an absence, and an OSS has a specific, a specific absence code, so that you know it was an OSS, not a, a um, choice absence. Okay. And again, that's language from the School Board Association. Okay, so we have to do it, no, not a big deal. Um, and right above that where it says career, and when the things that you're getting approved for, career and technical education student organization activities, um, what about um, like in science Olympiad? I mean, that's a that's a club, you know, mm -hmm. or robotics that club. Against them. But that does that fall under number three? School initiated and school scheduled. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yes. how come we have to call out career and technical? I, I'm, I, mean, I don't I, have a problem with it. I'm just wondering why we do that. I wonder if it's the job internships. I, I don't know. No, this says student organization activities. So why wouldn't mm -hmm. student if, let me go, it, it let me might go to the be, because career and technical education is a federal um, program, it might be that there is some reference to that in the federal regulation okay. that says that local dis I'm guessing because yeah. CTE is not mine, yeah. but um, I'm guessing the reason it is mentioned is because, like Dr. Faison said, there are so many um, like job embedded right. and, and on, you know, off-site school opportunities with internships. That, that is probably something in the CTE. Yeah, right. for example, we're trying, and, and you're not aware of this yet, because it's, it's, just, it's just chatter, but we're trying to do something with the chamber where those some students will actually do some visits. And, it, and technically, they're not CTE students, but it is gonna be a partnership with them. So there's so many things that this, the, the career and technical education um, program does that looks different, so maybe that's it. Okay. All right, so back to Mr. Wildeboer. That's That was all of my comments. I just wanted to say, if I'm not going to be on the committee, I wanted to make sure I said those out loud. The, all right, so I will um, second your um, motion to keep policy 4400 as it is, um, because we have to have a policy. Um, and then, but um, have it go back through evaluation for that. Are, are we? Are we intending that this will go into effect um, in the school year 22-23, which means July, so that means we really have to get rolling um, on that. I mean, it, is that doable? Um, it's gonna be tough with the summertime, but I do think that should be a goal. Okay. I mean, obviously that's not part of the motion. I was just asking that question. All right, so we'll go ahead. Um, um, all in favor? Aye. Okay, aye. All right, so we're going to keep 4,400. Um, we're going to hold it in, in committee. Revisions will be held in committee. All right, so that's all we had for policies, unless anybody's got another one to sneak in. 
move we adjourn. Oh, that's it. No, we don't. All right, so um, the, the last thing that we need to do, <laughs> item five, is um, Mr. Boyer, who is the chair of this committee, um, wants to recommend, since we now um, are on a really short you know, time frame, I mean, not time frame, we only have you know one or two to go, um, wanted to move the meeting for the policy committee back to where how you they used to do it in like an hour before the board meeting um, so that we could just get those done and then everybody's already here and we roll into the board so that the time would be moving it to 3 30 um, so it would go 3 30 to 4 30 give us a half an hour to redo whatever we need to do um, and then move right into um, the, the board meeting so that's what he wanted um, us to he's in favor so um, thoughts on that the, the only thing I would offer for consideration and I think it's fine is the format of the room would need to be the same as it would be for the board meeting so the board members of the dais the senior staff at their tables might and then we roll right into the meeting without the necessity to logistically change the room up if, yeah. if, if that's well, fine and the, what they used to do was we had it in here right but is that something but the, the public can yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's the public can come in if they want but it's it's tight yeah, it would be a consideration. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's not possible to live stream from that room as we can from in here. We've okay. got this camera set up. Um, so that would be the consideration. Yeah. Now, I don't see that as a problem. Um, Dr. Faust, do you have an opinion on that at all? I, don't have I mean, we're going to be here anyway. It's just going to be add an hour to our extremely long day. But Am I missing anything, <laughs> Anita? Did I characterize that appropriately? Okay. Can we take the ROR for the end then? I like that. Take the I what? second that. <laughs> the hour. We take the hour off the end then? I would like to take three hours off the end, but the, yeah. <laughs> we, we can work on that. All right, so um, I am making a motion um, to move for our committee to move back. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay, so all in favor? Uh, okay, so that's a 2 a 0. So you said 3 <laughs> 330 to 330, 4 30. yeah. It'll be 3 30. If, if we're not resetting the room, as I just heard. Could we not move it, say four to five, and then? Well, because that way, we're, because there's there's things that all of us need to do to get ready for the big the bigger meeting, okay. um, and then just so we have at least thirty minutes of downtime, okay. you know, to prepare ourselves up there, mingle, go Great. out, lots of prayers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We don't all right. A, we don't have a policy. All right. So now, um, only when we do. Okay. Right. I'm asking. I'm I think sorry. She's, I think she means every week. Oh, okay. Every so, do we have a policy? Will we have a policy meeting in front of every board meeting, or only when we do, we'll come at three thirty? If if we have any policies, because going right. forward, we should okay. have okay. a policy okay. every okay. meeting. Okay. You know, so it should only be, and then that would be announced and separately, and, and okay. you would know in plenty of time. Okay. Questions. Thank you. Kim will keep us all on track on that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, Mr. Boy, I mean, Mr. Wilbur. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I will make a motion to <laughs> adjourn this wonderful meeting. Okay, a second of that. So, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. I'm mistaken. Yeah. I said aye. <laughs>